I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. All opinions expressed by Ted and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Capital Allocators or their firms. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of Capital Allocators or podcast guests may maintain positions in securities discussed on this podcast. My guest on today's show is Nikolai Tangen the CEO of Norgus Bank Investment Management, where he oversees the $1.3 trillion Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world. The fund owns 1.5% of all public equities worldwide and 2.7% of all listed companies in Europe. As part of his effort to communicate with constituents, Nikolai also hosts In Good Company, a podcast where he interviews CEOs of large global market-leading companies. Before taking the helm three years ago, Nikolai was the founder of AKO Capital, which today manages $20 billion and is one of Europe's leading hedge funds. Our conversation covers Nikolai's investment path, lessons learned along the way about interviewing and leadership, and transition to the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. We discuss the history of the pool of assets, Nikolai's approach to serving as a universal owner of assets and his goals as leader of the organization. Before we get going, we're hosting our fifth cohort of Capital Allocators University in New York City on February 22nd. CAU is designed for allocators with five to 15 years of experience to connect with each other and learn critical frameworks to help advance their careers. Rahul Mudgal and I will be joined by a few past guests on the show for a day filled with presentations about skills, Q&A, and small group discussions. For those who have attended one of the first four cohorts, we're now ready for you to return for a second semester too. Spots are limited, so hop on the website and register today. Thanks so much for spreading the word about Capital Allocators University. Please enjoy my conversation with Nikolai Tangen. Nikolai, great to see you. Thank you. Great to see you too. Why don't you take me back to your first learnings about research and interviewing? The first time I started to think about interviewing was when I was in the Norwegian Intelligence Service. And as part of the program there, we did some training in interviewing. I guess it was called interrogation at that stage, but now it's not such a popular word. You just thought what you could get out of people if you asked the right questions and the right follow-up questions and right preparation level and so on. And it just struck me that was a really, really important thing. When I set up AKO, I thought, you know what, we probably can get more out of companies than other people. And we started to train the analysts in interview technique or interrogation or whatever you call it. Got the leading uh, interrogator from the Norwegian police force to set up a course. We hired an English person who was superb and who had helped develop the whole interrogation framework for the English police force. And together they made a program. And it was the best program that money could not buy because there wasn't anything really available. And it's really important. Imagine the people who spend the time talking to other people like lawyers, doctors, and so on. And they've got no training in how to ask questions. So it's a really powerful thing. What are some of the key lessons you learned? The thing is that you are very good at it, but it has to do with preparation work. Ask simple questions. Don't build too much into the question. Don't try to show the other person that you are an intelligent guy. Just ask simple questions. They'll realize soon enough that you have done your homework. Don't ask double questions and just keep it short. And drill down, follow up on some of the answers. Once you learn some of those things in Norwegian intelligence, how did that take you to a path to investing? I started to study economics in Norway and then went to Wharton, studied there, worked five years as a researcher, and then went on to a hedge fund. And then it was after that that I set up my company. That's when I really started to develop these things. I'd love to hear about your formative experience learning in the business. Yes. The first place I worked was called Kazanov. It was an old brokerage house research outfit, later bought by JP Morgan. It was a 
fantastic acquisition by J.P. Morgan when they did it. And I worked with a guy called David Croft, who ran the European department, a super guy who sat down with me, taught me to build models, taught me to ask questions, really taught me everything I knew about analysis. How long did you stay there before going over to the buy side? Five years. I worked at a hedge fund called Edgerton Capital. It was one of the first hedge funds in Europe. It was ran by and started by John Armitage and Bill Bollinger, really superb people. We talk about AAA in financial markets. I think if you talk about people, they are really AAA plus. And I think we underestimate how important apprenticeship is for investing. And starting a fund is not something you can just do. You need to learn from something. You need to have credibility. You need to know what you do. You need to know about risks. You need to know about how to treat clients, all these kind of things. It's not something you just come up with. You need to learn from somebody. And John and Bill were just really instrumental in teaching me these kind of things. So in that time at Edgerton, what did you learn about equity research that was different from what you'd experienced before? I would say John Armitage is an extremely thorough guy with incomprehensible work ethic and drive and a unique understanding for business models and what make companies successful. Very good with people. So I would say the most important thing was probably to learn what is a good business, what are important modes, what is operation leverage, what does it really mean, how much of your incremental revenue drops down to the bottom line, these kind of things. The importance of balance sheets and strong balance sheets, and just how to just ask questions and follow up with companies. I was a huge learning. Bill Bollinger, he was a bit more on the risk side. I learned a ton from him as well. But I think another thing which is important is you have to make hay when the sun is shining. It's the easiest thing is just to hedge away all types of risks. It's to hide. It's to spend all your money on put options to just protect your own side. But there are times where you just have to run naked. You have to take away the protection. You have to have market risks. And that's a real skill set. When to take away the brakes and go for it. Because there are some periods where you make all the money and you have to be in the market then. What did you find were some of the predictors of those periods? Fair. When other people were really, really fearful. And that's something that I have done also subsequently. We did it at AQO, we did it during the financial crisis, because you need to have max exposure when the world looks the worst. When you are at the bottom and you are the most afraid and you can hardly sleep, that's when you need to take your protection away. It's very counterintuitive and it's very, very tough. Alongside of being naturally contrarian, which is what you're talking about and taking risks, you have to run a business that sustains through those periods. What did you see at Edgerton about how to run a successful hedge fund business? Client first. Just think about clients. If there was ever a question, you got to allocate a profit between the client and yourself, you give it to the client. Always those kind of things. And honesty and transparency. Clients, they want to hear the truth. Clients in the financial business are very clever. They are seriously not stupid. They understand that things go up and down. If you are really truthful their tolerance for volatility increases. Were there any examples of times where it wasn't so obvious that being honest and transparent was the right thing? No, I think it's always obvious. I mean, if you're a long-term thinker, it's not only obvious, it's the right thing to do. You have a true north, right? You have values. It's just always right, to be honest. How did you get to the point in time where you decided it was time for you to move on I had been well paid at Edgerton. It just felt right for them and for me to move on. And that's what I did. And they were also instrumental in helping me set up AKL Capital when we did that after five years. In between working at a hedge fund and starting your company, if I remember right, you took a little break to study. I did three years. Ticked off a lot of the cool stuff I always wanted to learn, cooking, diving, and so on. But I also spent two years studying art history. And that was a tremendous thing to do. Why did you want to study art history? Because I had collected art for a long time and I had read a lot of books and I just felt that need to put it into some kind of system. When you work in an investment company, your intention span is roughly like two seconds and spending time in the library studying pictures and paintings, I took it back up to two hours. Now, having had a break for three years, I realized that I was studying art history. I was okay at looking at paintings, but I was probably better at looking at stocks. I was a really pedestrian art historians. I decided to set up AKO. Managed to hire some really good people. First person I hired was the secretary I had at Edition. She was phenomenal. Nikki Staples. And then Gorm Thomason, a Norwegian fellow. And then we built up a team. We were like seven people. Seven people and a dog. And we raised $550 million. It was a very good launch. Got some fantastic investors and then built from there. 
And when I left 15 years later, it was north of 20 billion or something like that. For perspective, what was AKO's strategy? It started off as a mid-cap deep research firm. Gradually moved a bit larger caps because we thought that the research methodology worked for large companies as well. Then increasingly became quality investing focused. And we hired some people who really brought that philosophy into the firm who had different types of backgrounds. One from had been at McKinsey. And we just saw that over time, the quality companies just surprised on the upside. The bad companies just always had profit warnings, bad surprises, bad management changes, these kind of things. But the good ones, hey, you know what? Always something great. They pulled some kind of rabbit out of the hat and surprised to the upside. When times were bad, they made some clever acquisitions, came out of it even better. And so to me, quality investing is really important. How do you think about risk taking? At that stage, we were running probably at two thirds market risk. We'd put option protection on the downside. So always lower risk than the market, but outperforming the market and compounding over time. Compounding is just completely underrated. Very few people think properly long term. In addition to bringing in these outside interviewing experts and building up this capability to understand how to ask questions, what are some of the other things you brought to your research process that helped you get better at what you were doing? In addition to interviewing, we brought in Forensic Accounting Group, really important. And that we have in the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund as well. We brought that in. We brought in Forensic Linguists, important again to understand conference call transcripts and meetings and so on. Very deep market research. So a big team of telephone interviewers and then data scientists and analysts. So we're really trying to combine a lot of different categories and a lot of different skill sets into making a unique research proposition. Alongside the investment strategy investment team, how did you think about the culture of the organization at AKO? So when you build an organization from scratch, you don't really think about the culture because culture is just an extension of the way you think, right? It's very different to build a culture from scratch and then inherent a company or inherent the leadership of a company and trying to make a corporate culture. So I never really thought about corporate culture as a thing at AKO, but it was a combination of hard work, honesty, deep research, being honest with yourself in terms of decisions, being able to change your mind when facts changed, transparency, client first, these kind of things. I thought corporate culture was so interesting because it is really fascinating. You have two companies, they do on the surface exactly the same thing. One of them is successful, the other one is a failure. What is it? You see it, of course, to the extreme in banking. They supposedly do the same thing, but some people succeed and some people don't. And it's fast, right? It's happening fast. But it's happening in all industries. You see it in the elevator industry. You see it in the footwear industry. I mean, you name it. You see it in the cosmetics industry. Some companies are doing well. Some companies are not. What is it? So corporate culture, really fascinating. So after a while, at AKO, I did a master's degree in social psychology and studied the corporate culture. And I just absolutely loved it. It's so important. What did you find in your research, both within AKO and studying, that gives you some understanding of what makes successful corporate cultures? It's a whole range of things. It comes from the top. When you take over a company, it takes a long time to change, at least five years, probably five to 10 years to make a difference. And it's called corporate culture for a reason, right? It's really ingrained in everything you do. And one definition on corporate culture is just how do we do things around here? And you can see it in so many different things. It's hugely fascinating. Analysts don't spend enough time on it because they think it's too long term, but it does change businesses sometimes within a five-year time frame. And also it is the thing that CEOs would love to talk about. It's what's on their mind. They don't like to sit there and talk about the next quarter. They couldn't give it to us. They're not interested in it. They think it's a waste of the time. They think you are a boring guy. They want to talk about corporate culture. They want to talk about what makes this organization tick. How can we pull away from the rest of the guys? That's what they want to focus in on. But do you think the normal analysts spend any time on it? Of course not. What are the types of questions you would ask to tease out the characteristics of the culture that allow you to understand the differences between two companies? So the type of questions I ask is exactly the type of questions I ask on the podcast in good company. A tiny bit of advertisement for that, <laughs> if you don't mind terribly, and please don't cut this out, Ted. We have a podcast in the fund and it struck me, hey, because we got a lot of money, we managed to talk to the CEO of the biggest companies in the world. And so we've talked to the biggest bank CEOs, the biggest tech CEOs, Sam Altman, Bill Gates, all these kind of things. And what I asked them is basically, in addition to why is your business good, it's what makes you tick? What is your corporate culture? What are you trying to change? And so on. 
And these are just really fascinating questions, and I spend a lot of time on it. When you spend a lot of time building up what became a very successful $20 billion asset management organization, you've built the culture, you have portfolios of companies that you think are some of the best in the world. How do you leave that? I felt that the learning had flattened out a bit. I felt that it was time to pass it on to the next generation. We had spent a lot of time on preparing the rest of the team to take over. I probably spent eight years preparing their transition. And I just wanted to move on and do something else. I really feel that life is very short and that we need to learn and that we need to experience as much as we can whilst we are still here. And we are not here for long. And AKO had been very successful. I thought if I could leave that to the next generation in a successful way, that would be fantastic because that rarely happens in this industry. And then I could go on to do something else. Now, I wanted to go back to university to study full time. I thought, hey, you know what? I'm going to Ikea. I'm going to buy some cheap furniture. I'm going to rent a flat. I'm going to go to jazz clubs every night. I'm going to be a student again. And hey, that's the best thing you can do. So then this job in the Sovereign Wealth Fund came up and destroyed that whole dream. And why did I think that job was cool? First of all, I love asset management. I think finance is the most fun thing you can do. If you think about what is it to be doing asset management, it's everything you eat, wear, drive, consume. It's made by a company. It's the corporate culture. We'll talk about that. It's the market. It's greed and fair. It's geopolitics. It's defense. It's technology progress. All these things. And it changes all the time. You could not invent a more interesting game if you tried. And if you're good at it, you even make some money. So it's a fantastically fascinating thing to do. I love that. And then, of course, this job here in the Norwegian Someone Wealth Fund is about running capital. It's about continuing to build the organization from a great starting point, which I love. How do you motivate people? How do you increase the transparency? All these kind of things. And then also doing something great for the country. I've been quite concerned about philanthropy generally and been spending a lot of time on it. This job just combined my three things. I'd love to go into the history of this pool of assets. It's not an old pool, as it turns out. So how did the Sovereign Wealth Fund come about? It's an amazing story. And to really understand the background here, you have to go out to the North Sea, a cold, wet day in October 69. You have to go aboard the drilling rig, the Ocean Viking, and they were drilling the last well in the North Sea. And if they didn't find oil, they would pack up the toys and go home. And two in the morning, this guy, Sal Wissner, was told to wake up the platform chief, Ed Seaburn. And Ed Seaburn was really fed up. He was just like, Sal Wissner, why do you wake me up two in the morning? You better have a good reason. And did he have a good reason? They had just struck oil. Ecofisk, the biggest offshore oil find ever. And this was announced then to the Norwegian population the day before Christmas Eve, 69. And wow, what a Christmas gift, you probably would say. But hey, not necessarily. In a lot of countries, it had been a curse because it had led to corruption, crowning out of industries and these kind of things. But then Norwegian politicians did something really clever. They decided to set up this fund. First deposit, 2 billion Norwegian kroner, has grown to 15,000 billion. It's been just an unbelievable travel. Very good fit work from the politicians, the Ministry of Finance had done a very important job, the people who worked in the fund and so on. It's been an amazing journey. And now the fund is the biggest single shareholder in the world, 1.5% of all the equities worldwide in 9,000 companies. In Europe, we own 2.7% of all companies. It's just been incredible. When did the fund actually get set up? 27 years ago. And what was the stated objective? To preserve and build wealth for future generations. After that initial infusion from the oil discovery, how's the fund set up in terms of either contributions or distributions since then? We get the oil and gas revenues that comes into the state. And then we have a spending rule so that the politicians can take out roughly 3% of the fund. And all this is politically anchored in the parliament. That's really important to have this democratic anchoring. But even with 3% of the fund being spent, that is now more than 20% of the Norwegian budget. So it's very important. And is that a net 3% outflow? No, it's for the moment, we basically get more in than we pay out. And that's generally been the case, apart from during COVID where the spending was a bit higher. As you mentioned so many times when there's some type of sudden wealth, whether it's a country, a family, an institution, it doesn't go well. How did the government set up the governance structure of this pool of capital to allow it to succeed? Yeah, it's a very good question. So these type of funds typically don't last for a very long period of time. The fund is owned by the Norwegian people in a way. It's 
taken care of by the parliament. The mandate is given to the Minister of Finance. They give it to the central bank. And then we sit inside the central bank. So they give the mandate to us. So it's a pretty complicated governance structure, but it works really well. And it means that we are, in a way, a couple of steps away from the politics. We are not a political fund. We are not used as a political tool. Very important. We have one overriding goal. It's to make money. But we also are making money in a sustainable way. So ESG is important for us. When that mandate gets translated to you through these various government entities, how does that come down to what your mandate ends up being as you deploy that into market? The Minister of Finance is doing a really good job in defining the mandate. So we have a pretty strict mandate in terms of how the asset allocation should be. There is also a risk budget attached to that. So that tells us how far away from the benchmark we can be. And that's how we need to operate. So the broad risk parameters are set and anchored politically. And then we try to get some excess returns out of that. So I'd love to walk through both of those. So what's that asset allocation as it's handed down to you? In broad terms, it's a 70-30 asset allocation. We can also do a property. We can do a renewable infrastructure. And we do both of those. Then the risk budget is basically defined as a tracking error budget. In two out of three years, how far from the index can you be? And what is that range? 1.2%. So we are an index near fund. And I think it's really important because when a fund is this big, if we were to lose a lot of relative money, like big time, I'd lose my job, right? You don't survive that. The problem is that you are being kicked out at the worst possible time. And typically then you would liquidate the positions and crystallize losses, which shouldn't be crystallized. And that is why it's important to be close to index because the governance structure cannot survive if the leadership of the fund takes too big risks. How have you staffed the organization to go out and pursue that strategy? So first of all, I haven't staffed it myself. I've been there for three years. Okay, so we were already full of fantastic people, really brilliant people. It's a very small organization. It's roughly a third of the size of what similar institutions would be given the asset size. We are 650 people, 650 people running 1.3 trillion. We don't have secretaries. We book our own tickets, own flights. You come and visit me in Oslo, you come into my office and think, gee, I thought you guys were running a lot of money. It's really laser focus on costs. And that's important because it does something with the mindset. And we are a public institution and we have to behave thereafter. And that's important. We have a large proportion which is run close to the index. There is an active element to all the uh, strategies we run. So even the index near funds would have different types of overlays and different types of long-term trades on. And then we have part of the pool, which we are running in a more active way. And it's important to do active asset management because it's also tied into active ownership because we have dialogue with the companies. We have 3,000 company meetings a year. We have clear expectations to how the companies should behave. We vote at the AGMs and so on. So that active part is important. When you start with your lens at AKO, which is obviously a far more concentrated portfolio, and then think about active risk in the context of the largest pool in the world, how do you decide what and how much to take that active risk? The risk taking in this fund is very delegated. So we have a lot of people running various mandates. One of the cool things working here is that you get responsibility early. You can end up after three years to run a billion dollars. So really great place to start because you get responsibility early and you are being trained by your colleagues. That's really important. Then we can at the leader group level also take some different types of risks. So we did, for instance, have a shorter duration than the market over the last few years. That's saved us quite a bit of money. So we can put on those type of positions as well. We don't do it very often. I think they need to be pretty fat pitches. They need to be situations where you think you are 65%, 70% likely to be successful. So you don't see many of them. How does the composition of the 650 people on your team break down between functional roles? Yeah, first geographically, half of them would be in Oslo. We have big offices in London, New York, Singapore, some smaller offices in Paris and Tokyo. We have a real estate team. We have a large and very good fixed income team. We have equity, active research. We have the more index-like. We have more than 100 people in technology. Big effort now on AI and doing really well there. Compliance, of course. So I would say the, the normal functions. 
How do you think about the balance between internal management and external management? We run 5% of the assets with external managers, and that's the assets that we have in developing markets. In developing markets, we think it's very complicated to build up your own expertise because we are in so many different countries. So we typically use managers there. It's been a very successful part of our strategy that generated consistent excess returns for us. We, of course, pay higher fees, and high fees is not a good thing in Norway. So we need to be sure that there is significant returns after fees, and that has been consistently. How have you decided to pursue that emerging market strategy? It's been a combination of things. We have a really superb team who's been doing this for a long time now. We've got a great methodology in place. It's a team of eight. They're doing it just like a super job, identifying the right people, staying with them for a long period of time, getting to know the investment philosophy and supporting them as organizations. Does the team have a bias for the types of external organizations you like to partner with? Small teams, small organizations, or small teams within some larger organizations. High duration relationships. We like to be important partners. So we have, in some cases, quite large parts of their AUM. I'm wondering how that math works when even 5% of your pool is $65, $70 billion in the US. How do you invest in smaller teams and funds when you're deploying that much money into emerging markets? You know this because you've been in this business yourself. We have roughly 100 relationships, so we spread it out. I'm curious to get your sense of the differences in the depth of research that you saw when you're more focused at AKO compared to across 9,000 companies in your equity portfolio at the Sovereign Wealth Fund? We do not research 9,000 companies. We research less than 1,000. But we do research them very well. Do we research them better or worse than what we did in my previous life? I think it's very difficult to compare a different type of research. How do you define those two different types of research? There are some similarities and some differences. One of the things, when you come into a large organization like this, you cannot change the investment philosophy overnight. I can't say, hi guys, today we are going to start to invest in quality investing. Everything you buy should have a certain growth rate and it should have a certain return on investment. Otherwise, we don't want to buy it. Okay, so you tell that to somebody who's got a mandate and then they underperform. Now, whose fault is that? That's your fault, right? It's not their fault. So you cannot do that. So people have to choose the way they invest themselves. And the philosophy in the fund has always been that there are many ways to skin the cat. You find the way that suits you and that's how you go about it. Now, and then I'm trying to get people to become even more long-term in what they do and even more focused. But in particular, the time frame I think is very important. And I really don't like frequent trading. I think you should trade as little as you can. It's very costly to trade because of friction costs. You move prices against you and very often you add little value. And then the more decisions you take, the worse they tend to be. You make one decision per month, probably quite good. Make 10 a day, probably not very good. When you add all this up at the asset size you are even with taking some active risk, there's no way of getting away from being effectively a universal owner of equities. One of the things you didn't mention is the world of private markets, which has become a growing part, certainly in the developed markets, of capital formation and businesses. I'm curious how you've thought about accessing that part of being a universal owner. Private equity has not been a part of the mandate we have. And we are in active conversation with the Ministry of Finance to potentially get that in. And this is a decision by the board. And we will soon make our recommendation and then we see whether we get it through the system or not. I think the arguments for doing it is that more and more of the value creation takes place outside the listed market. Companies are owned longer by private equity than they have been in the past. They are bigger when they get to the market and we automatically buy 1.5% of them when they come because that's what we own of the world. So a lot of that juicing has already been done when these oranges or lemons come. And I think it's right to take part of it also because that market is growing bigger. It's getting close to 10% of the size of the world stock markets. And I think it's pretty clear that there are some excess returns there. The ESG aspects have improved. Liquidity has improved. Transparency has improved. Fees have come down through co-investments and so on. So I think there is a pretty strong argument for it. But as I said, this is not my decision. This is a decision by the board and the ministry. We have the infrastructure to cope with it. We have the sector analysts, we have the capital market specialists, we have the relationships, we have people who have picked external managers, I think we have the corporate culture for it, we have the legal framework for it. It would take very little extra people. And also, we are the only large fund in the world of our type who are not doing it. 
It's a bit like when you start uh, out in competition in orienteering or whatever, right? And everybody runs in one direction and you're the only one who runs in the other direction. You just have to think, do you hold your map upside down or what? You just have to consider what you're doing. And that's what we're doing now. As you're waiting for the governance board to decide what happens, imagine you've thought through and mapped out how you might go execute if you did have the mandate to do so. How do you think about that deploying large sums of capital into private markets? Really good question. First of all, when is a good time to enter this market? Hey, this market is in trouble. Private equity companies are not having a good time. Fundraising is difficult. Exits are difficult. Financing is not easy. You have a lot of debt coming up to renewals. This market is not great. And I don't think it's going to be great for some time. In my mind, good time to enter potentially. It's a bit like when we increased the equity share during the financial crisis. I think this could be one of those. How do you go about entering this market? You do a combination of primary and fund funds and you buy some secondary so that you get a good spread on managers and vintages so that you don't take one big vintage risk or one big manager risk, but you spread it out and you build it up as some mosaic. It's pretty clear to me who are the good PE companies to be with. And it's interesting when you ask them all, who do you respect in the world? Who do you think are the best? It's the same names who come up all the time. It's fascinating. So in the EM world of your external managers, you mentioned being with smaller managers. As you've asked those questions about private equity, where does that break down in terms of well, size? Well, I should be a bit careful here. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> there are some really good large ones and clearly some very good medium ones. All right, we'll let that sit for now. As part of this idea of universal owner, there's a whole bunch of things that you could think about in terms of making the companies that you own better. You mentioned sustainability. Your money comes from oil. Would love to hear your thoughts on the whole ESG world and how you've applied it to the pool. It's important for us to invest in a responsible way. And that's what we do. We have, I think, the best ESG team in the world, probably. We have a framework of expectation documents we have laid out in great detail how we expect companies to behave in terms of corruption, climate, water usage, human rights, and so on. So that impacts and guides the way we expect companies to behave. It also guides the way we vote at AGMs. And we do it through conversations that we have with our companies, and we do it through the voting. We vote at 12,000 AGMs every year, 120,000 proposals. It's a big machine. We announce voting intentions five days ahead of time so that everybody in the world can see how we vote. And there are only basically two other big voting instructors, and we are in a way the third independent voice. Really fascinating. How have you thought about environmental risk? The thing is that if you're a small company with 20 companies, you can hide, but we cannot hide. If we have one company which pollutes somewhere in the world, we pick it up in the rest of the portfolio. When you are a part of the whole world, you cannot hide. So you have to care about environment. The climate is a financial risk. And when people politicize and say that climate is a political question, I just don't get it. To me, climate is as political as gravity. How do you integrate that with the stream of cash flows that come to the fund just from oil, which is one of the fossil fuel pollutants. Well, it's oil and gas, okay? And gas is still a very important part of the energy solution in Europe for the next many years. I don't think it's unethical to exploit your oil and gas resources. Not at all. It's a very important part of what makes the world tick. But we have to think long term how we deploy that capital. And that's what we do. You mentioned wanting your team to think even longer term than they had before. How do you instill long-termism into the investment process? It's not easy because we are short-term in our thinking. Imagine, Ted, you come home and tell your partner or your partner asks you, hey, what did you do today? Nothing. Day after, nothing. Day after, nothing. Day after, nothing. It doesn't feel good. But in investing, the best thing you can do sometimes is not to do anything. So one thing which I think is interesting is inertia analysis, right? You take your January 1 portfolio, see how it goes if you didn't change a thing, what would they have been the results? And then you look at what you actually achieved and the difference in what you have subtracted or added by going to the office every day. And you'd be surprised how often you have subtracted value by going to the office. You should have been staying on the beach. And that's a pretty humbling exercise to go through. It's tough not to do anything. I remember in my previous life, I had an investor who had a really good year. And I said, do you trade a lot? They hadn't done a single thing. And they hadn't changed a single position. And they had a phenomenal year. So it's possible. How do you create 
incentive schemes on your team to try to elicit that behavior? We do have a rolling three-year way of looking at results. Is it the perfect way? No, it's probably not. And probably the incentive structure could be even more long-term. It's funny, this thing with long-term, because when you are young, you're in a hurry. When you are 25, one year, wow, it's such a long time. Now, when you are on my age, one year is very short, right? The closer you get to death, the more long-term you become. And that's just really intriguing. Oh, I met a guy, a Spanish guy, the other day. He was like 85, and he was just planting some pistachio trees. Now, I don't know how long time it takes for a pistachio tree to start to bear fruit, but quite a bit of time, right? He was really excited about his long-term prospects for his pistachio trees. 85, hey, that's cool. So there's an element of long-term investing comparable to where you started your career. And obviously, when you have these assets that you just think of buy and hold. At the same time, you've mentioned there are instances like you're thinking about private equity now where being contrarian really can make a difference and move the needle. People are notoriously not good at market timing. So how have you developed frameworks for deciding when is the time to move off the tried and true path, maybe to take more risk or in this case, try to if the opportunity presents itself, invest in something where everybody else is running the other way? It's a super good question. What I do is I just try to gauge greed and fair. And fair, it's relatively easy to gauge. You have the VIX index, I measuring the implied volatility. But you can see it like under COVID, you saw it in the amount of news that was about COVID. You could read about the worst case scenarios. You could read to which extent the specialists disagreed on the outcomes, because when specialists disagree, that's really scary. So you can see that people were incredibly afraid. We feared for our lives. That kind of fear you can measure. You can measure during the financial crisis when you have a CEO and you ask him and say, so how can this possibly now turn to the better? Nikola, there is no way this can ever get right. We are doomed. There is no hope. Hey, of course there is some hope. So you just need to speak to people, you need to gauge that fear, and that's what I tend to do. And then on the other side, euphoria, much more difficult to gauge, much more difficult. But you have to just get a feel for how much champagne is flowing, how loose are credit standards, how complacent are investors, and you just have to put it in some kind of framework. That's in a way how I look at it. There's a lot of this human input and judgment that you think about that goes into these things. You mentioned in passing data science and AI and your use of it in the process. And I'm really curious how you've thought about bringing AI into this process that is predominantly a universal owner of assets. So we don't really use it to pick investments. We use it to time the deployment of capital. When we get money into the fund, we use it for that timing. And we use it also now increasingly to minimize trading. Since we are an index near fund, we can buy a Tesla on a Monday and sell it on a Friday because of index changes. And by using these type of AI models, we can reduce the amount of training and save a lot of money. That's where we deploy it for the moment mainly. Since you've come into the seat, you've probably been more public than any time in your career. And you talked about the importance of transparency. I'd love to hear how you've thought about being transparent in a different way from how the fund might have run previously. Yeah, very important. It was a relatively secretive fund in the past. And when I came in, I thought it was time to open it up. And we have opened it up internally and externally. Internally, we have a lot more internal communication going on. And internal communication is key to performance. What we see is that the organizations which perform really well, those are organizations where information travels to the people who need to know. And everybody should know as much as they can. So now internally, for instance, we publish the notes from our leader group meetings. We transcribe them, summarize them through ChatGPT, put them out on the internet. Everybody can read what we discuss in the leader group. It's the most read thing we publish internally. That's one thing. Externally, we have opened up. We are showcasing more people. In the past, there were four people who could talk on behalf of the fund. Now, 650 people can talk on behalf of the fund. We are more in media. We communicate more with the stakeholders because we see that the more knowledge you have about the fund, the more you trust the fund. And trust is completely key for a fund like this. And we were selected the most transparent fund in the world by this transparency company in Toronto called SEM this year for the first time. And we're really, really proud. It's not so easy to be transparent. So we work really hard on it. But I think it's completely key. And also the podcast we mentioned in Good Company is also part of this transparency. And the LinkedIn is follow me on LinkedIn as well. We publish a lot of things there. 
What we see is also that this drives applications for our jobs. We have, in many cases, 10 times as many applications as we had in the past. Over the last 12 months, the level of applications have doubled. So we get better applicants and we are a relatively small company. We need the best and the brightest. And so if you're a brainy person, you have to apply to us. Super happy I get all this advertising in here. Thank you a lot. I probably need to buy a beer or something afterwards. What are some of the other benefits you found from being open and transparent? I think when you are, it makes it easier to align the organization towards the same goal when you all publicly go the same way. I think it forces you to be even more honest with yourself, not to change your mind, not to have a mission drift, these kind of things. I think openness is only positive and we are as open as we can. And we even publish all of our holdings once a year. And I think probably we can do it twice a year. I don't think we can do it more often than, because then you can start to gauge how we trade. And so that's not great. But apart from that, we can do it. We publish what we talk to companies about in our company meetings. Check out our website. It's incredible. When you're deploying so much capital into markets, I'm really curious what the impact of your activities ends up being on just this much smaller asset management industry in Norway. My hope is that we can be a force for good in the Norwegian asset management industry and that we can have some positive repercussions for other companies. We have an investment conference coming up in April, which I think will be the best investment conference we've ever seen in that country. We are attracting the best asset managers in the world to come and talk to us and we'll stream it so everybody can listen in 23rd of April. But we also have a very big summer program. We have taken more people than we need in our summer program. We have a big graduate program. So we try to over-educate a bit. And we have a teaching program where we teach at various universities, different type of courses, and we put our experts out there. We try to do something good there for the asset management industry generally. And it can be big. In Dublin, I think there are something like 100,000 people working in that industry. There are less people in Oslo. There are also, of course, different tax rules, which make it a bit more challenging to start up and so on. But I think over time, Oslo could be a pretty cool center for this because we got different priorities than what we had in the past. I think our priorities changed during COVID. It was easier to work remotely and we appreciate nature more than we did. In your couple of years in the seat, I'm curious how much all of the activities you have found find their way into the stories of the beneficiaries that you serve. When you think about the fact that we contribute one out of five krona into the budget. Implicitly, you do a lot of education budget, national health budget, all these kind of things. I do try to talk about that to the fund that, wow, we have certainly have an important role in the country. I think it's one of the reasons why we get so many applications these days. People want to have a deeper sense of purpose in their lives. And this is a very clear purpose. Where do you want this to go over the next five, 10 years? That's very clear. We want to be the best large investment company in the world. How would you measure that? Performance is one. Reputation is one. Long-term thinking, integrity, ethics, ESG. It's a combination of things. It's also people. Do people have a good time? Do they thrive? Do they get to use their full self? Are they in the flow? A whole range of things. I'd love to ask you, maybe particularly from your podcast in Good Company, what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned from your guests? There are many ways to be a successful CEO. But the first thing that strikes me is that they work a lot, right? You just don't become a CEO by chilling all the time. You are in there. And I asked Jensen Huang of NVIDIA, how much do you work? And he said, Nikolai, there is hard work and then there is insanely hard work. So I said, where are you? I work insanely hard. I work from five in the morning until I go to bed. I work every day. I work every Saturday, Sunday, holiday. And wow. So then I said, so yeah, but when do you relax? Yeah, but Nikolai, I relax all the time. And that's because he's got passion. And passion is the second thing. So it's hard work and then passion. These people are passionate. They love what they do and that's why they work so hard. The third thing is grit. Why do you have grit? You have more grit if you are passionate about what you do. You can take more shit. You can take more backlashes and more resistance if you really love what you do. And then they run towards problems. They take the problems. And that's also really important. What's been your most memorable experience doing the podcast where you came off and said, wow, that's really why I <laughs> wanted to do this? I get that a lot of times. It's a bit like when you meet a person and you have a meaningful conversation and you just get deep into something. That's just really fascinating. What an honor to be able to have a, a whole hour with some of these people. To spend an hour with Bill Gates or Jensen Huang or Sam Altman or James Gorman or you name it. That you get a whole hour with some of the most important people in the world who shape the world into what it is. 
And some of them help you look into the future as well. It's really fascinating. I love it. And lifelong learning is another thing that they will mention. And this is part of my lifelong learning too. I read up on these podcasts during the weekends, probably the same way as you do. All of them feel a bit like an exam. You don't want to disappoint the people who listen in. You don't want to screw it up. You don't want to come across as a fool vis-a-vis the person you interview. So it's just a really cool thing. And we have got hundreds of thousands of people who've been listening to these things. And hopefully some people can learn some as well. How do you go about preparing to interview such a wide range of executives? I get great support from the organization. So we have a sector analysts who cover the various sectors. I've got a guy called Sigur who is helping me prepare as well, who's collating a lot of this information, and doing a tremendous job. Then I have a lot of good friends in a lot of different fields and who are very clever. And I typically ask them, hey, any help here? Any good questions I should ask them? And to get this thing from different type of angles is really helpful. And then I spend time myself doing it and putting on my own thoughts. And hey, that's, that's the way we do it. Nikolai, before I let you go, I want to ask you a couple of closing questions. What is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? I would say it's nature. And I walk a lot in nature. It's good for psyche. I pick mushrooms in the autumn. I ski in the winter. I sail in the summer. Nature is where I relax. What's one fact that most people don't know about you? I do collect art. And I started 25 years ago when I did that break. So I built now what is the largest collection in the world of Nordic modernist art. I've given it to my hometown in Norway where I grew up and they will open a museum in May, which I think will be pretty spectacular. So just buy your tickets. Another advertisement. (laughs) (laughs) What's your biggest pet peeve? Unnecessary red tape and bureaucracy. I like speed. I do think speed is a mindset. How have you fostered speed in a larger organization that's so important in every move you make? Super question. Speed is not necessarily a mindset in the public sector, okay? There are different priorities. You need to be very accountable. Everything you do needs to be traceable and you need to prove that the necessary work has gone in there. And so it is a challenge, but there's also a lot of learning, right? Because when you really anchor something solidly, it makes the change easier to make because the stakeholders have been part of planning the change and so it's easier to conduct it. And so you can operate within a bigger system, but it just takes a different way of working. That's been a great learning for me. Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? I would say there's been more than two. I mentioned the one at Casino, David Croft. I would say the two people at Edgerton, John and Bill, really important. And then my colleagues at AKO were important in forming me. And then I love working with my new colleagues in the fund. What's been the happiest moment of your professional life so far? Probably when we got the first really incredible client at AKO. When you set up a fund and then you have a world-leading investor giving you your money and trusting you with the money, and you know that you have passed the most difficult exam there is in terms of building a firm, and they have done DD left, right, and center for months, and they have checked everything, and they have therefore implicitly okayed you, the team, the organization, and the process. That is a big moment. What's the best advice you've ever received? To always go for the most difficult choice, to just always run towards the problems. I've always tried to take the most difficult way. All right, Nikolai, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? You are not in a hurry. You've got a lot of time. Think long term. Nikolai, thanks so much for sharing your path and the seat on top of a very large pool of assets. Thank you, Ted. Thanks for listening to the show. To learn more, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com, where you can join our mailing list, access past shows, learn about our gatherings, and sign up for premium content, including podcast transcripts, my investment portfolio, and a lot more. Have a good one, and see you next time.